very, very comfortable chairs where all the people at the council chambers here sit down, uh, which makes you wonder why do people want to be a councillor in a council, to sit down in a chair like this? Yeah, and to, li and to listen to people speak and debate and vote and get paid for it. Yeah. I think that's probably what it is. Yeah. That's professional in meeting attendance. <laughs> I wish I could be one of those. Talking about professional meetings and attendances, uh, we have a, a, a kind of entity that's going to be in the next seminar that some people might have heard of if you are i mean it's, it's pretty obscure it's, it probably would be a pointless uh, answer in pointless Ian jackson steve livingston yeah 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 nonsense aside brace yourselves because ian livingstone and the steve jackson uk tm because they probably you should trademark his name by now. Yeah, yeah. For, for the US <laughs> listeners, there is another Steve Jackson. Yes. Uh, the real the one. American one. <laughs> this is the real bona fide <laughs> Steve Jackson. UK Steve Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're going to be telling us everything. Well, not us, yes, but the whole audience around here. They're going to say everything about their fantasy, fighting fantasy books and how the games workshop start and the transition to video games and answering questions from the from the public which if i if i have a chance i i will be delighted to ask him one or two of the awkward ones as will uh, dr reddy here i'd love to ask awkward questions that's <laughs> I, I live and dream of asking awkward questions watch out <laughs> and keep watching i'm here livingstone this is um what's your name uh one of the two steve jackson one of the yeah. two. Um, thank you for coming today. We're going to um, talk to you, obviously, about um, a little bit about, about fighting fantasy, in fact, a lot about fighting fantasy, and a little bit about the history before that, uh, Games Workshop. Um, it's quite amazing that we're here today at Dragon Meet. Um, Steve and I were the founders of the original Dragon Meet way back. I'm trying to remember what year it was. Maybe it's on the Google somewhere. Late 70s. 78. 78. 78. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, were you there? <laughs> you don't look head. old enough. So um, obviously we're going to start off with, with fighting fantasy and um, let's do a little straw poll first. How many in this room have actually ever read a fighting fantasy game book? Have you? Which one? <laughs> okay, and, and I presume everyone's heard of Games Workshop? Yeah, okay, this is good. Right. Let's get started. So, but um, some of these slides you would have seen already, I'm sure, but um, for those who haven't, I hope you're going to enjoy a little bit of our history. Um, this is Steve and I back in 1975 when we started Games Workshop in our flat in uh, Shepherd's Bush. The really handsome guy with the beard, that's me. Uh, the guy in the middle is uh, John Peake, and uh, obviously the person on to your right is Steve. Now, we were all school friends at Altrian Grammar School, and we met it back up in London in the 70s with various rubbish jobs that we were doing. Uh, but we were great games players, and we wanted, ideally, as young guys, to try and form a, a business around our own hobby of playing games, try and turn that into a, a business of, of at least distributing and hopefully making them one day. So. Um, We published this full-color glossy magazine called Alan Weasel. Who's got a copy of Alan Weasel then? Number one. Blimey. Whoa. I saw one went on, on eBay went for about 100 quid recently. No. What, four pages? 25 quid a page. Bargain. <laughs> um, and uh, we sent it to, out to everybody we knew in games. And um, one of the recipients, not, although we hadn't sent it directly, was this gentleman here to owe, we owe a great, uh, huge of, of debt, both from, uh, as an industry and as certainly from Steve and I's point of view. This is Gary Gygax, uh, which is in the photo I took in 1976 at Gen Con. And uh, he and Dave Arnson, as you all know, had um, created this incredible game, Dungeons and Dragons. This was a, the very first role-playing game of, of mass market potential. It was uh, la three largely unintelligible rule books but it, as you know, it opened up a whole imagination, um, <coughs> of a whole world for the imagination to explore these amazing labyrinths of rooms and passageways populated with monsters and treasure, the very first commercial role-playing game. The only problem with it was that you couldn't understand what was going on from the original rule book. You hadn't a clue. 
We got hold of a copy of Dungeons and Dragons. We, we got approached by Gary and Brian Bloom, who was his business partner. Um, they liked Alan Weasel and would we be interested in selling Dungeons and Dragons? We'd vaguely heard about this game and really wondered what it was all about because it sounded like nothing that e anybody had ever done before. Um, and so when we got hold of a copy and tried reading through the rule books, we were no better off than <laughs> before we started because it was completely unintelligible. All these unique concepts in there, like having a games master running this show, um, no end to the game. Um, you, the, the, uh, you became a character uh, that developed. All these were completely new concepts. And uh, it was only after a trip to City University uh, where there was a small games group that somebody in the, in the group, um, Andy Holt, I think it's here, uh, and Steve Biggs, uh, who'd played the game before um, and showed us how it worked. And after that, boy, we were blown away, weren't we? It just yeah. became, we became evangelists for this game. So we ordered six copies, because that's all the money we had to our name. And on the back of that order, we got a three-year exclusive distribution agreement for Europe. Um, <laughs> that's the way to do business. <laughs> Because what we didn't know also is that uh, whilst we were operating a flat, so out of a flat, so was Gary Gygax. So out of a print run of uh, 1,000 copies, this six order was pretty substantial. And uh, we were, became his European representatives. So we went over to the States um, to Gen Con 76 to sign up all the fledgling young companies. Uh, in that picture from, as you're reading from left to right, um, sadly the first three people are oh, no yeah, longer yeah. with us, they're dead, and I'm next in line there, so uh, <laughs> that's a bit of a worry. Uh, on the far left, you've got Fritz Lieber, then Gary Gygax, then Professor Bach, who invented Empire of the Petal Throne, which I'm holding two copies there, then Rob Kuntz, who worked a lot uh, on D&D, on and... Man with an unfortunate name. And, um, and Steve at the front looking a bit grumpy or something, I don't know, I'm not sure. Astonished, I Astonished. Think. Um, at the same time, we also got to see Miss Wisconsin. Um, Rather gratuitous. I don't know what she's doing today, but we're here. And um, we ended up having to live in Steve's van when we set up our first uh, office because we eventually got turfed out of our flat because there was just too much action going on for the uh, landlord to, uh, to bear all these people coming up and down the stairs trying to buy uh, Dungeons and & Dragons. And, the phone that was on the ground floor was the only phone in the whole apartment block. We certainly didn't have a phone in our apartment. There were certainly no mobile phones back then. So uh, we were forced to find us a new place to live. And ha still having no money, by which time, by the way, John Peake had left, because as soon uh, as, as he... He was the woodworker. He was kind of responsible for why we, it was called Games Workshop, because when Games Workshop's first products were um, wooden backgammon. Uh, go and Wari sets and John was the craftsman who made beautiful versions but when Ian and I started getting into fantasy he thought this was all a bit um, juvenile and he had no interest in it whatsoever so he, he wanted to get his social life back again and uh, he left. So he left pre d and or at the point we, we acquired D&D. So um, we got this tiny um, office at the back of a state station in Shepherd's Bush where we parked Steve's van next to it, and we joined the squash club, which was next door. So in the mornings, we could have a shave, a shower, etc., and got pretty good at squash by default. And then into the small um, office where we stayed till midnight and beyond doing our mail orders. It was so a funny um, thing, this office was, was tiny. Uh, there was just about enough room for two people in there, plus the stock. And as... Um, Customers started arriving that wanted, we were the only outlet for fan fantasy games and people would travel down Well, they come from Europe. They'd come from uh, Scotland um, to shop uh, They'd made a special visit and when they came into the the office uh, and, and they saw what it was They were astonished and we were rather embarrassed that we had to go and stand outside while they did their shopping When they finished the shopping then they, they come out and uh, we got our office back again um, we ended up opening our very first shop in uh, April 1978 in Hammersmith, not far from here, in a road called Dalling Road. And Steve and I worked above that and sometimes in the shops on a Saturday. And uh, this is the queue. We are yet to meet anybody who is in that queue. Please, one of you be in, say, you're all too young, I'm afraid, but um, we'd like to meet somebody who's actually in that queue just for old time's sake. 
They are. It was amazing when we, um, we, it wasn't actually the first day, the shop had been open for a few days before, but we'd scheduled this special opening day mainly for the press. Uh, and I think we got the Hammers, the local Hammersmith newspaper came along, a military modeling we, we used to advertise with, so they had to come along. So from that point of view, not a great, not a load of press from it, but um, it was astonishing to arrive, uh, on the Friday night before the Saturday morning, uh, we were having this press reception with our two press people. And uh, this guy started hanging around outside. It was six o'clock in the evening, so the shop was shut, and he was just hanging around. And we got a bit suspicious and opened the door. Yes, can we help you? He said, no, 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 it's fine. I said, well, you're not here for the opening tomorrow, are you? He said, yeah. And he'd arrived at six o'clock in the evening on Friday to stay overnight. And this was all to get his hands on either, one, either of our special offers, which was a copy of Empire of the Petal Throne, uh, reduced from 16.25 to a pound, <laughs> and six copies of Dungeons and Dragons, reduced from six pounds and 10 pence to 50p. So he, yeah. he stayed up all night. We, we came back the next morning, and uh, the queue had grown from this one guy on his own to, to what we see now. Um, of course, this um, Games Workshop obviously grew in, uh, in size and uh, wanted much better high street locations. This, this branch is no longer a Games Workshop stop. Um, if you want to go and see it, it's nearby. It's now the Bosnia and Herzegovina <laughs> Community Advice Centre. So um, if you want to go pilgrimage to the first workshop shop, it's not far down the road from here. So, um, of course, workshop is now and it's a very professional outfit. Steve and I are no longer uh, associated with the company, but it's still great to see being successful, doing largely what we set off doing in the old days, specializing, um, selling our own products, um, White Dwarf magazine, and it's issue one, and as it looks today. I don't know, why did we choose decapitation for the Oh, uh, we the were being time? ballsy, weren't we? We just, we, <laughs> we like that. We, we thought we were being a bit cheeky, showing mm. blood and gore. But yeah. it, it wasn't as prevalent as it is these days. Citadel Miniatures, of course, which is a... Uh... Citadel came about, there was a guy called Brian Ansell who um, ran a company called Asgard Miniatures, the first, or well, actually the second, um, fantasy miniatures company and he arrived one day saying right uh, we've disbanded Asgard and I'm all yours <laughs> what uh, uh, but anyway he had a plan to uh, find a small workshop somewhere and uh, start producing his own miniatures which he sculpted uh, so we we thought this was a good idea and uh, set him up uh, and he grew Citadel from virtually nothing to what it is today, which is uh, you know, the leading uh, miniatures company in the world. Brian was an exceptional person, um, uh, but not, not particularly an exceptional sculptor. And I think the, uh, the big break, apart from the founding, came along uh, when we, we discovered the Perry twins, or Brian discovered the Perry twins, Michael and Alan Perry, who were two uh, youngsters, who were probably about 16 at the time, absolutely brilliant sculptors, uh, and a lot of Citadel. And they still are today. And they still are today, yeah. And of course, um, Warhammer came about um, largely because um, at the end, when we had our three exclusive distribution agreement with TSR for distributing Dungeons & Dragons, at the end of that period, they wanted to merge the two companies, TSR and, and Games Workshop. Steve and I were violently independent and uh, said no to the, to the merger offer. And um, suddenly realized how vulnerable we were because we were no longer exclusive distributors of D&D. We were still wholesaling it, but we weren't the exclusive agents. And so we needed uh, a new franchise, some new intellectual property to, um, for the company. So the team uh, under Brian Ansell's um, leadership set about creating its own role-playing system. It started with, fancy, with Warhammer Fantasy role play. So it was uh, Rick Priestley. Um, <laughs> Richard, uh, Richard Halliwell. Richard Halliwell and, uh, and, Brian. and Brian themselves um, mm -hmm. wrote Warhammer Fantasy role play. And of course, Warhammer became the, the, the pillar franchise of Workshop and they've done incredibly well with it. 
interesting thing from a business point of view, and we always um, look back on this, that was the, the deal was with, with TSR that either we merged or we'd be, be sort of cut off from our exclusivity of Dungeons & Dragons, and since that was by far our best-selling item, it was a di very difficult decision to make, but we decided to stay independent. And um, uh, at that point, TSR set up TSR UK, and it was run by somebody who we knew quite well, and from a business point of view, uh, if they would have uh, cut us off, not supplied us with Dungeons and Dragons at all, they might well have done some serious, well, Games Workshop wouldn't be the uh, force it is today, uh, but they elected instead to keep on supplying us because that was the American model. The American, um, America is so large that you have regional distributors, so it's quite normal for a manufacturer to sell to the uh, regional distributors who then go on to sell to the retailers, and there are all those margins in it. In the UK, is very small. There was no reason to have more than one distributor, um, but because they were used to the American style, they kept on supplying us with Dungeons & Dragons, much to our great time relief. to launch our own new products. Mm. So that's, that's Workshop in a nutshell. Um, how Fighting Fancy came about was really because of Workshop, because it happened during the time that we were uh, still running the company. And um, it came about as a result of Games Day 1980. Um, we, in those days, Workshop wasn't just all about its own products. We had, and, and we talked about other games and, and franchise in White Dwarf magazine and wrote about them. And then we ran Games Day, we invited other outside um, suppliers to have um, trade stands like there are t at Dragon Meat today. And um, one of the people who took a stand was uh, Penguin Books. Uh, they had a, a book called Playing Politics, which was nothing to do with role playing. And um, we met Geraldine Cook, and Steve will tell us more about that. Yeah, the, the game that they were, the book that they were publishing was, was kind of like a party games thing, where it was a set of rules where you, after dinner uh, you had to get people to vote for you. and, uh, and so. Uh, didn't do particularly well, I don't think, but the contact with Geraldine Cook, we said to her, you know, look at what's happening here in, in uh, uh, at Games Day. This fantasy gaming thing is growing. And she was quite impressed with what she saw, and she said, um, well, okay, so do a synopsis for a book, and maybe we'll, uh, maybe we'll publish it. So what we were talking about originally was more a how-to-do-it manual. These are the games, this is the, way you, the miniatures, um, this is how you play. Uh, the suppliers, that kind of thing. Um, when it came to this is how you play, we thought it might be a nice idea to do a, a sample of role playing on a limited basis, limited choices. And that was really the kernel of the idea for fighting fantasy that that, uh, uh, that came up. Because as we thought more and more about it, this idea of a, a solo role playing game was much more interesting than uh, this dry how to do it manual. So um, Geraldine was expecting to get this manual, but in fact she got this uh, multi-page thing where you had to go backwards and forwards, mainly illustrations because it was uh, easy to do. Um, and she wasn't sure about it at all. Well, this sat on her desk for about six months and, and we'd phone up every so often and say, we've made any decisions about it, no decisions have been made yet. Um, and then eventually we got the go ahead uh, that they did like the idea and they would um, publish. Uh, so that in, was in the first meantime, of all the magic Steve, quest. You'd also written to George oh, Alan, Alan and Unwin, yeah, the Lord of the Rings publishers, to try and get them interested because we, you know, we thought we had something of an interesting idea here. And they wrote back a letter back saying this is not the sort of thing that we do. Thank um, God they did because um, mm. if we'd written Gandalf's Adventures, we wouldn't have been owned that intellectual property <laughs> there. We'd have just been a work for hire for Alan Unwin and the Fighting Fancy would never have come about. So that rejection letter, we have a lot to thank for. Yeah. Mm. Oh. This happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. So Games Day was um, the starting point of our connection to Penguin Books, who in the end ended up publishing them under Puffin label because they, they hummed and hard, they couldn't decide what age group would be interested in, in, in an, an interactive book. And uh, I think they chose wisely with Puffin, although yeah. they didn't do much to promote the initial book, Warlock of Firetop Mountain. They did some posters, didn't they? Which some, there might be a few of them out there yeah. was it with a competition that they sent round schools. The reason why they went with Puffin was really when they said that they thought the role-playing um, market, the, the players, 
he makes all kinds of noises. Um, the the role-playing players were sort of teens, uh, students, uh, adults, so it would be more sensible to have a puffin, but a uh, um, penguin brand. But puffin had an entry into the, the schools. They had their own school book club, and they could immediately send out 5,000 um, uh, catalogues uh, and uh, flyers to advertise the book. And that's what really was one of the things that kick-started the whole, uh, whole um, solo role-playing game, Fighting Fantasy. Uh, Anybody got an um, original copy of Warlock? Wow. Well, not a reprint? The, the very uh, first one, great. Well, there were about 10,000 of them published, I think, the first one. Yeah. But they still didn't believe it in, in, in the series themselves, they didn't understand it, but certainly the sales reps didn't, because it looked like a normal book, but it wasn't a normal book, but, um, but they kept reprinting in very small numbers until finally the gentleman came on the phone and said they wanted two more. Now, we'd written this first one together, which had been a bit of a nightmare, mm -hmm. and I ended up writing up to the, up to the river, and Steve wrote, rewrote the second half, and then there was a huge inconsistency in mm -hmm. style, and this noble man here, <laughs> rewrote the whole lot into one consistent style. It so. was funny. We knew at the time that there were differences in, in for example, the combat system. Ian had one combat system, I'd done another one. <laughs> and when it came to merging the two together, uh, well, our, our editor told us very politely that you got to the river, which is halfway through the adventure, and then the style changes completely. Uh, so it wasn't going to work out uh, as it was, and Muggins decided he'd uh, rewrite the, the, the rest of it to, to be the, uh, so that's why it's come out with skill and stamina um, and luck. I don't know, what were the differences? I can't remember <laughs> now. No. We used to try and sort these differences out. Uh, I'd go around to Ian's and we'd say, yeah, well, let's, let's sort the combat system out. We won't tell you what, we'll play, that point, play, the, we'll play you pool for it. So we used to have a game of pool and then uh, and yeah. it never got sorted out, did it? So um, this is the, the Warlock, uh, and the illustration the illustrator we used was uh, Russ Nicholson, who's an amazing artist. His, his attention to detail is uh, incredible. And um, yeah, and that's one thing we, we talk about a little bit later, is that we almost dictated to Penguin that we commissioned the art for the books because their suggestions were like nice little nice little dingly dell with a mushroom and Fairy a gnome, stuff, gnome sitting it, on yeah. top. <clears throat> and we wanted to something that was going to leap out the we page wanted decapitation, and rip, didn't we? rip the face off the reader. And uh, so we argued and we, we won, saying you know, we knew better, so to speak, because of all our Games Workshop um, experiences. The um, illustration that, that uh, caused a bit of controversy was the one, was one in House of Hell. As you're going through House of Hell, you go downstairs. And there's a there's a, um, a black magic ritual going on down there, and there was a woman uh, who was on an altar. It's standard stuff, isn't it? Uh, and there was just a little bit too much of one of her breasts that was showing, and that one had to be edited. Uh, but the rest of them, what about I the think other one? <laughs> <laughs> so, as you know. Um, the difference between our books and, and traditional literature is that, is that the reader is the hero, and that really set them apart, and um, it became um, a, a big hit in the playgrounds, and that was the viral spread at the time, that word of mouth, as is today, was um, so important, and that resulted in, in people talking about, oh, these great, these great, great books in which you are the hero, and you go on these fantastic adventures, and there's loads of choices, and they got get killed, and started again, so that was the important thing. We, um, we were told that there was a black market in solutions to fighting fantasy books, that as soon as we, one was published, there'd be uh, some bright sparks that would go off and crack it, uh, and then offer for 10p a solution to uh, a death trap dungeon. So was that you? Chaos, it was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a good thing there was no email at the time. So branching narrative with the game system attached, we don't need to explain that here today, but... Um, it was uh, something of a, a revolution at the time. Um, making these decisions, each person you meet, whether they're a friend or they're a foe, whether they're gonna give you information or not. And introducing quite simplistic role-playing attributes, skill, stamina, and luck as well. Um, finding treasure, some of which may be useful. And we had to stop people cheating. Who cheated in this room? 
So there's only about four liars, I see. <laughs> um, so, of course, we try to devise anti-cheating measures. So if you found, as you know, if you found a key, they often had a number stamped on them. So when you got to a door and asked, do you have a key? If you do, turn to the number that's been engraved on that key. But people still found a way. The, the five-fingered bookmark you used to see people uh, on the tubes and on buses, and there's, yeah, peeping around the corner, so to speak. But we didn't care, as long as people were having good, good, good time. People told us when we asked them, they liked the harder ones. And I don't know whether those people would just say that because it kind of implies that they've cracked the harder ones, or they did like them to be harder, but it persuaded us to try and make them tougher and tougher. I suppose maybe that was part of an anti-cheating. And of course, so we said it, mentioned it earlier, the, the artist played such an uh, important role and uh, Peter Andrew Jones did the, the cover for Warlock, which Steve has in his possession. Yes, I do. Yes. Mm. Well, you've got all the other covers. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> um, and so here's some of the covers. Uh, I used to like uh, Ian McCaig. He did um, a lot of mine, uh, Forest of Doom. And what we were trying to do is to really threaten the readers, have the, the, the images, uh, the leaping out, setting the challenge to the readers. And Ian McCaig was amazing, in, in my opinion. He went on to design uh, Darth Maul in, in Star Wars, so well done, Ian. So another one of mine, um, Death Trap, and then over to Steve, we don't want to talk about his artists. Well, that was Ian Miller. Ian Miller was um, uh, quite a well-known artist at the time, and he did a particularly, I think he did a really good one uh, for House of Hell. And uh, the, the the one cover that I had been disappointed one with was Citadel of Chaos, which was book number two. Yeah. I had this great big gollywog on the front. And uh, finally persuaded Penguin after about three or four years to let Ian Miller uh, have a go at that one. And that's turned up with the, um, the cover that you now, now got on Citadel of Chaos with the whirling dervish. Yeah. So whilst I stuck um, mainly to uh, orcs and goblins and, and, and fantasy. Steve always wanted to try uh, new worlds, new genres, and um, so... I kind of like to, s to what could be done uh, with the system. Um, and af after you've um, done a couple of 400 adventures, uh, then uh, what else can you do with the fairly simple role-playing system? Well, obviously, one of the things is different genres, so horror, superheroes, science fiction are the obvious ones to do. Uh, but then other things like uh, with Creature of Havoc, reversing it. So you're the, you're the bad guy. You, wa you wake up and you don't know who you are or where you are, uh, but you know that you're hungry and human flesh sounds quite attractive. Um, and, and that one worked. That was quite a difficult one, though, wasn't it? I don't know, I never read it. <laughs> I'm just rambling. And then oh, the sorcery, his yeah. epic sorcery, which I'm sure you'll... Uh, well, it used to be an epic. I've just seen an adventure out there with 1,600 references. Hmm. Uh, sorcery got a bit carried away with that. The, the reason why sorcery came about originally was uh, Geraldine Cook, poor old Geraldine, who discovered us at Penguin. Uh, then Puffin took over the Fighting Fantasy series and was given all the acclaim for its great success. Uh, and Geraldine, who'd, who'd done the groundwork, uh, didn't have anything like that. And I'd always promised to Geraldine, um, I'll do you a, a more adult fighting fantasy. Uh, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Um, a more adult, a more complicated uh, uh, fighting fantasy book. And that turned into sorcery, which was one adventure broken up into four, and it used magic. It was interactive uh, shades well. of grey ahead of its time. <laughs> 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 They did actually, Penguin did actually try, one of the editors there uh, came out with a series of uh, girl-based multiple choice, so what would they call it? Lonely Hearts or something like that. They did, yeah, they did the horse riding ones. Yeah, but they did have a romantic one as well, I can't remember what it was called. Didn't do very well. I don't want to hear about sorcery. <laughs> uh, oh, I've, I've talked about sorcery. Okay. We'll have lots of questions, uh, time for question and answers when we've finished uh, glossing over our history here. So the net result is um, over 17 million copies sold uh, around the world in, in 30 languages. Um, <coughs> new editions are, are still being uh, published, uh, Chinese more recently. And whilst we always try to um, ensure that these editions had the artwork that we wanted, 
sometimes territories manage to get the rights to um, do their own editions and convince us that they knew their market better than we did. One of those territories is Japan, and uh, I'm now going to show you the uh, Japanese cover for Death Trap Dungeon. You can make your own mind up whether what you think about it. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. Yep, they really encapsulated their adventure there. Yeah, they certainly know their market. <laughs> Thing of beauty. So that was the uh, how they looked originally. Um, Fifty nine in the original um, publications. The missing sixtieth one, Blood Bones, and we're going to be introducing John Green here. He must. Where are you, John? He's Where's hiding John? somewhere. Oh yeah, he's down there. We'll, uh, give him a. F a f oh no, Stuart as well. Uh, and Tony. Okay, we'll Hello. give him a chance to talk about what he's up to in a minute, but. Um, yeah, 59, the original Puffin series, affectionately known as the Green Spine Books. And um, it was always, always lots of, we had lots of publicity. Uh, three things that I think helped the sales of Fighting Fantasy was that the Evangelical Society published an eight-page warning guide uh, about Fighting Fantasy, saying that um, because you're interacting with ghouls and, and demons, you're going to get possessed by the devil, and therefore they should be banned. This is fantastic stuff. They couldn't have helped us better. Mm. And um, one worried housewife in deepest suburbia phoned into a local radio station and said that after having read one of our books, her, ch her, her son had, had levitated. <laughs> so <laughs> for, for £1.50, they could fly, so I thought I'd have some of that too. <laughs> and uh, John Craven was asking us uh, when we were going to write a real book, when we had like number one, two, and three in the bestsellers list. And uh, <laughs> we're actually getting ki children reading, reluctant readers, and encouraging creative writing and art and people to be uh, very much involved with books. You know, that didn't count for much in his eyes, but uh, there we are. So, Fighting Fancy, Warlock of Fire Top Mountain, um, 30 years old this year. Uh, incredible that um, the legacy lives on, and we're, we're very proud of that. And um, there's been other iterations, but never been a movie or anything, because there was never a, a major character, a major hero. The heroes, of course, were the readers. Therefore, that the, the character was lacking, so there was never a, a movie, which is a shame. But there were other things. For a start off, there was Steve's board game. Mm. Yeah, Games Workshop published um, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, the board game. Anybody got one? Oh, a few people. Ah, okay. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, it got published in French and German. Uh, and I think the, uh, the, the maze system was probably the bit that was you know, vaguely innovative <laughs> about it. Uh, Are you going to tell us about it? Well, you, you go into the maze and yeah, you uncover things in, uh, in front of you. <laughs> Fascinating. You do, yeah. Can't wait. You, you, can see, you can see why I'm not the salesman of the uh, two of us. So you have to roll different dice after the river? No, I didn't. <laughs> nice one. Um, you can see this beautiful, rich 3D uh, immersive uh, console game here, which was uh, on Spectrum at the time. Um, yeah, that was good to see, actually, see them in this. Uh, simplistic form. Uh, more recently, there was an app put out by Big Blue Bubble for uh, five titles. Um, I mean, they were good, but they weren't great. They didn't really add any, any value, any features. And um, they, we, we terminated when, uh, their oh, agreement expired, yeah. after ex when it expired. And mm. of course, he's now working closely with Tin Man Games. Um, is Neil in the room? There he is. Neil, doing and a fantastic we'll talk about, job, Neil. We'll talk about that in a second, but um, the difference is that the, the production values and the extra bits that you find on the app through Tin Man, rather than just being a straight port. But they did a very good job for us to get the games onto the, on, to get books onto the app store, and we've got a lot to thank Big Blue Bubble for saying that the world moves on. There was a, a DS game, uh, didn't actually make it, um, over here. Has anybody got one? Yeah, actually. Okay. 
Um, it was only published in the USA and not in great quantities. And there was Death Trap Dungeon, um, PlayStation game on PC, and there's a lovely Kelly Brook before she became famous, was our model uh, at uh, the trade shows. So five years ago, we had our 25th anniversary. Um, we did a signing at Forbidden Planet, and um, that was good. The hardback edition. Anyone got the hardback edition? Seen a lot of those around today. Yeah. So it's my personal favourite of, of the uh, formats because it's it just seems to work so well with a hard cover, doesn't it? It's about the size of an old videotape case, and it seems to be something of substance. And of course, um, this year was the 30th anniversary of, of Fighting Fantasy. Now, we talked about cooperating uh, on a, a book for, to celebrate the 30th anniversary, but um, why didn't we, by the way? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I wasn't really. I think I was more keen, to put it mildly, yeah. than, than Steve. Was to, I doing something? Was I because it was always going to be a labour of love. It was never going to be a commercial venture because you know, the world has largely moved on with, with, with game books in, in book format. But um, I felt it was important to, to celebrate the occasion because you know, 30 years is a long time and that the fact that it's still in print in, in large parts of the world is, is something to be very proud of. And uh, so I said about um, thinking about it in 2008 or nine. And uh, the net result is that Blood and Zombies um, appeared in August this year. Now, we were originally going to do something in Alansia, hopefully around Firetop Mountain, but didn't want to do that without Steve. And maybe we'll do that for the, the 40th anniversary, because at our age, it'll probably take us 10 years to write the next one. And um, having been working in the video games industry for the last 20 years, um, I was very aware of the everlasting love of, of zombies and also realized I hadn't put any zombies of any, any quantity in, in previous uh, Final Fantasy game books. And there was also the dilemma, we were, was I going to write it for 10-year-olds uh, of today or 40-year-olds? We were trying to be 10-year-olds again. Um, that was a problem. Even though Final Fantasy had quite a, a relatively simplistic um, game system compared to traditional role-playing games, by modern day standards it was still quite frustrating for some people in the sort of quick way which we, we progress through our everyday lives these days. And so I decided to risk streamlining it down even further because I also had in the back of my mind having an app and people don't want to come up to lots of points, pinch points, where you can't move on quickly through an app. So streamlining the experience down to basically one uh, factor, which was damage and, and stamina for your, your death. Uh, so I wanted to make it fun. I wanted to use social media and, in, and using Twitter. Uh, to determine the title, whether it's going to be Blood of the Zombies or Escape from Zombie Castle. Um, it was great also <laughs> when I lost a huge chunk of my book in a fatal crash on a laptop, that there was a lot of uh, support out there from uh, from uh, from the fans about uh, sympathising about this, and that kind of spurred me to carry on going with it. And um, also using Twitter to offer the chance for for some of the fans to be in the book, and uh, that was uh, so that was uh, and all people had to do was just say, "Yeah, I'd like to be a zombie." And so we ended up with a couple of famous people in the book as well. Uh, it was good to find out that Charlie Hickson was a fan, so he's in there. And also um, Tom Watson, MP, who was uh, headed up the Leveson Inquiry. So he's a, a zombie also in Blood of the Zombies, so it's brilliant. So there's a number of Easter eggs in there, certainly a lot more Easter eggs in, in the app. And uh, the artist um, worked for the first time with, with Greg Stables, who was a very big um, 2000 AD artist. And, Here's some of the original sketches when they had a conversation. This is one of the proposed covers of one of three. Uh, this one when they're escaping from the, the prison cell. Uh, this one was the, the girl in the, <coughs> in the cold room with the chainsaw. And the one that finally went for was the, the zombie bursting out through the, through the door. And the reason I like that was because harking back to the days with Ian McCaig when he always had that sort of look at the reader with the threatening uh, look. It was... Um, one that won it over for me. So that worked into the um, 
the art as it came through. Um, thought it was a little dark for a, for a cover, even though it was a beautiful thing in its own right. So with the digital uh, help at hand, um, Icon Books ramped up the red through Photoshop to make it um, uh, much more stand out on the shelves. So I'm delighted that it uh, came out in August this year. And for the, for the interior illustrations, used another comic book artist, Kevin Crossley, who worked closely with to um, really capture the, the essence. Straddling modern day contemporary settings with, with zombies in, 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 in today's world, but still harking back to you know, the roots of fighting fantasy, setting it in a, in a medieval castle. Because uh, I didn't want my zombies to be running around shopping malls and uh, garages and stuff. So here's one of uh, Kevin's um, interiors. Brilliant stuff. The lovely uh, <coughs> grenade scene, which he also um, coloured up. And it's in your app, isn't it, somewhere? What do you mean, no? <laughs> we didn't do it. I thought we did. Oh, sorry, me. So, leading into Neil, um, the book's also come out as an app on iOS and Android, and I'm sure you're all downloading it right now to make Neil happy. Um, if not, please uh, talk to him later about what the extra bits you can find in it. So, here's some of the screenshots from it. It's done an amazing job and added so many more features. Of course, you've got 3D dice in there all the record keeping is done for you, there's little easter eggs and stuff to find, collectibles and little surprises, history of fighting fences in there, so it's a, it's a very nice package. Well done Neil. And there's this one's in it, this is a, a Martin McKellen original that's been broken up into how many pieces and hidden them in the book. And uh, you can then put all the component pieces into an album as a collectible. Um, the book the review pretty well. My best quote is, Blood of the Zombies is awesome. My friend Shane doesn't like it, but that's because it's really hard and Shane is dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so I <d> <laughs> that's in PC power play, which is great. But I did make it intentionally hard because I knew most of the readers were going to be late 30s, early 40s. And you like a challenge. The next app is going to be House of Hell. House of Hell, yeah, and it's coming on. Neil tells me it will be released in January after the Christmas rushes die down, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. So what next for Fighting Fancy? Well, some of you may be aware that Sean Riley was trying to, a uh, was going to um, use Kickstarter to fund a documentary film that he was going to put out uh, on a DVD and also on a memory stick, and maybe one day um, give it to one of the networks to broadcast on television. He was trying to raise £40,000, um, which is a substantial amount of money. It was a lot less than what he thought it would actually cost. It could be, he was thinking maybe it could cost eight to £100,000. Um, uh, that Kickstarter funding um, raise ended yesterday and sadly he didn't raise all the money. So he raised, I think, 15 out of the 40. Um, so that documentary, in its present guise, is not going to happen, sadly. But um, what is happening in the future, um, Steve and I may or may not write one for the 40th anniversary. I was going to say that, you know, with the, um, the, the Kickstarter thing, there are a couple of YouTube videos out there, and one of them in particular is the Dragon Stem thing. It's hilarious. You should watch it. Yeah, it's great. Did anybody, let's see, anybody actually sign up for the no. Kickstarter offering? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry it didn't happen. We're very sad. Um, someone said to me, why did someone sent me a tweet said, well, why didn't we put in the balance? I mean, and that's a bit like vanity publishing. We couldn't have done that. You know, fund your own documentary. That kind of... Well, that would have been yeah, it was Sean's project, me. really. It wasn't yeah. something that we were... Um, uh, yeah. We were just doing all this stuff on our own back. But in, in documentary style, um, uh, I want to talk, bring John Green up here now, who's one of our... Stalwart Finding Fancy Writers, um, Hell of the Werewolf, Night of the Rainster, etc. Who's planning on kickstarting writing a book which is going to about, be about the, the history of Finding Fancy. And he's going to try and do a bit of a straw poll now to see if anyone might be interested in, in reading a book. And he's going to tell you a little bit about 
what he's going to put in, you know, all the stuff, all the glossy stuff and the nice stuff that we've been telling you today. He's going to write about the underbelly of fighting fantasy and tell you all the stuff that we, we don't want you to hear about. So, Okay. Um, did anybody John. read my article in SFX Magazine Fantasy Special this year about the history of fighting fantasy? A couple. Fantastic. Good. Right. That was how it started. So back in the new year, I was talking to Stephen Ian about doing this for SFX. And they went ahead. It was commissioned as 2,000 words and ended up being published as 7,000. And yet having done that, I realized I'd only just scraped the surface. So I've continued to interview people since then. I've been fortunate enough to interview Charlie Hickson, the one who was mentioned earlier. Um, I have some other interviews lined up. I've talked to the original artists, and um, also many of the other authors, because of course, they then had the Fighting Fantasy Presents uh, line continue with the demand for titles. I've talked to a lot of them, um, gone into a few of the, the legends and myths about the series. And the plan is um, quite soon to launch another Kickstarter, um, but to produce um, a book about the history of fighting fantasy the last 30 years, including loads of interviews, um, all sorts of original artwork, <coughs> and um, all sorts of things that possibly has yet to be decided, depending on how the Kickstarter goes. But yeah, the straw poll time. Take the hands here. My life in my hands here. Who would like to buy a book like that? And the pass Not me. That's what I was <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to That's buy brilliant. two copies. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, so that should be launching quite soon, hopefully. Just got to iron out a few details. Um, <laughs> ideally, to be ready for this time next year. Um, I could do another straw poll, actually, because Icon Books are also considering doing a, uh, uh, an offering around Blood of the Zombies, ending with a one a, a hardback cover and one with a specially hand-printed, leather-bound, embossed, a one of one in ten. And I'd be interested to know, because they wanted to, uh, me to ask you the question, whether there'll be a, an interest in, in the, such an offering for sort of very limited editions of very high quality uh, publications. So is any any interest in, in the room for that? Depends how much it was, really. Well, I've no idea. That's their choice. Yeah. Any interest in, in, in collectibles around one particular book? You yeah. can name any book. It doesn't have to be Blood of the Zombies. My kids put their hand up, it's all right. <laughs> Right, we're off. Well, you won't be seeing that yeah. one then. Um, <laughs> well, they, every, people have to know how much it is. Well, I have no idea. It's not no, nice. I know, but you can't really. Anyway, that, we'll let you know when that's happening. So, um, so over the years, people have been, you, you see strange articles about us. So, so there's two things I, I realised I wanted to mention that people wrote an article recently about the, the fighting fantasy and actually the, the gamification of literature. How we'd suddenly... Um, got greater engagement with people who don't normally let read books by adding a, 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 a game system to a traditional novel. And uh, more recently, there was someone on Twitter said um, that they were quite astonished that uh, we hadn't been credited for inventing hypertext, which <laughs> 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 and it was actually Tim, so Tim Berners-Lee taking all the credit. Of course, that's a ludicrous proposition, but uh, there is some... Uh, crossover there with what we did with, with linking numbers together. So these are the kind of weird stuff we now read about fighting fancy as people look back over, over history with, um, with uh, their own perspective on it. So there we are, uh, fighting fancy, 1982 to 2012. We're still uh, very proud to say what we've done. Uh, long may it continue. And uh, we're very happy to answer any questions you have to offer in the last 10 minutes. So. I'd just like to say that uh, around the, the room here, we have not, it's not just Ian and I, but Fighting Fantasy is bigger than the two of us, really. And there are people like John who've written uh, some of the adventures. Uh, and Neil, who, who's doing the Tin Man adventures. I see Tony Howe over there, uh, one of the artists uh, of uh, Fighting Fantasy. And for these people, uh, who have I missed out? Have I missed out anybody? Who else is around? Anyway, I'd, I'd just like everybody to give a round of applause for these people who keep fighting down to see what it is today. Thank you. And then, yeah. So, questions. Yeah, gentleman at the front there. There used to be one in Richmond. I think that's moved now, but in Richmond is, is where I live. And uh, I, I used to go in there and nobody had a clue. <laughs> I went to Games Day um, a month or so ago. Uh, few people recognize that, but you know, it's just some old bloke wandering around looking lost, you know. <laughs> no. 
Can you yeah, just do it from the front? Oh, right. Oh, Graham. Forgot to say Graham. Where's Graham here? Uh, Graham's on the stand. Oh, he's on the stand. Yes, no, Graham the Bottley original. is doing. Uh, Graham Bottley is doing. You, you're talking about the new version of A Dance Party Fantasy, yeah. 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 Oh, we weren't very close with Mark Gascoigne and, and others on, on, on those on original, the original ones. Yes, yeah. But um, uh, the, the, new, the new one um, is completely Graham's work. Obviously, referencing the original. Yep. Just a sort of thing in comparison between uh, American fantasy games and uh, around the same period, you've got things like Dead Boys and uh, Fighting Fantasy, and what's happening in the UK. I can see the contrast. What seems to be the, uh, well, apart from the rules being slightly more stripped down in Britain, it seems to be the same, it's quite more straightforward. The biggest difference to me is the kind of We wrote for ourselves, yeah. really, didn't we? I mean, that was uh, we were thinking about would we like it, really, yeah. rather than thinking, well, it's a bit gory for eight-year-olds and our market is eight-year-olds. Actually, our market was higher than that at the time because it started off in a teenager's college um, university students and that sort of thing. So um, we pitched it a bit higher because the Endless Quest series, which is what you're talking about, in the States that was published by uh, TSR, was very much written down for sort of eight-year-olds. Uh, you read a whole page and you got two different choices. Uh, they did fantastically well in the States. Uh, I think it was just yeah. that the time of the universe uh, that, that solo game books were, were due to come out and they would have come out in one form or another. We happened to be the first in the UK and, and endless, well, I suppose it was Choose Your Own Adventure, but uh, in the States it was a little different. I can remember going over to one of the, um, the HIA show, which was the trade show for business in the States, and all the games companies would be there. And uh, it was, must have been 1981, I guess, and I was talking to one of our suppliers, and he said, well, what, what are you guys doing? I said, oh, I've been working on this, um, on this uh, interactive book story, and, and I described what was the magic quest which turned into War of Firetop Mountain. And he said, I don't believe it. And he went running off to the back of his booth and he came out with a manuscript that thick and it was exactly the same idea. You know, it's, it's, uh, I say, it was just that since Dungeons and Dragons had been out for a few years, solo game books were going to come. It was just a matter of who did it first. Yeah, we certainly didn't want to compromise our language. As Steve said, we were writing for ourselves rather than trying to think what would you know, an eight or nine, ten-year-old be happy to read. We know what they wanted. They wanted to be scared. <laughs> and we wanted to give them the sort of realistic fantasy rather than patronise them in any way. <coughs> well, they're all coming up now. Yeah, front row. For years, I thought that you guys were translating local books. Because this is in our Steve Jackson reading in from Quebec's version of it by the other author at the time, by yourselves. Yeah. Well, John Green. <laughs> Is he here today? Uh, we like Jamie Thompson as well. We thought Jamie did a great, great job. The, uh, the whole thing came about because... We couldn't keep up with the demand. After, after Warlock had been such a success and Citadel of Chaos, Forest of Doom came out and they, they did well as well, um, other publishers started to come out with... You know, it was rumoured that they were doing something, like some kind of game book thing. And the author, so who were the authors going to be? Oh, well, most of the authors came from Games Workshop. Yeah, Joe but Lever the, and Gary Chalk. Were, were working at Games Workshop, uh, and they put together this book and left and had it published separately. And a, a number of people did that. Uh, the the defence that we'd come up to, a strategic thing, was that there ought to be a new fighting fantasy book every month. So when the readers go into the bookshop once a month, they can either have this brand new system uh, that nobody's ever heard of, or there's another fighting fantasy book, and, and that seemed to work well. Well, there's no way in and I could write a book a month. Uh, so we had to start bringing in other writers. And coincidentally, the very first person to do a Jackson and Livingstone Presents book was, anybody know? Steve Jackson. Steve Jackson. <laughs> Not me, US Steve Jackson. 
Very confusing. Very confusing. Right, we've got five minutes for more. <coughs> um, right at the back, we haven't been there yet. Um, yeah, yeah, you. I guess I guess I play more video games these days, yeah. just because they're the, the immediacy of them. They're always around, and and I've suddenly uh, I've just discovered getting into um, all the old board games that I used to play as apps. And so you know I'd crawl into bed at eleven o'clock or something, and then I would, we've got a quick game of Can't Stop going with a few friends, and it's one of the iPads out and play it. So. Uh, it would be difficult for me to say, but having said that... That's bridging it, isn't it? It's, it's board yeah. games in digital format, does that count? I mean, you're asking a question, it's like, you know, what's your favourite child, you know? <laughs> One of your children, <laughs> we're going to have to throw into the abyss. <laughs> so it's not choice. an easy decision, you might hate us for having to make that decision, but it's very tough. We don't want to do, uh, do either, to be honest, you know. We still play board games all the time, we don't role play so much. But you know, we we just love games, and to make us choose between analog and digital is very cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough audience, isn't it? Yeah. Let's go to the other corner. They might be a bit more friendly over there. <laughs> What's your biggest regret in business? Oh, I, I know what that is. I'd say. One of my big regrets was that when the um, original Fighting Fantasy, The Magic Quest, was lodged with Geraldine Cook and it sat on a desk for nine months. During that nine months, Endless Quest came out in America. Uh, well, no, they were released about the same time, but it suddenly, we, we had a nine months head start, basically, on the series in the US. Um, that was Endless Quest books. And also, um, the during that time, um, the... Uh, editor of the Dell books, the US edition to the book, uh, moved jobs as well. And so those two things combined meant Fighting Fantasy did less well in the US than it could have, could have done because should of have the done. delay, because it should have, should have done. And that would have been nice. I mean, from a, from a business point of view, I guess that would have been nice. But also, um, you know, it's, it's every Brit's ambition to crack the American market. Uh, we could have done it if only Penguin hadn't have been in their financial difficulties at the time and they'd have gone ahead with the book. But that's the way it goes. There's nothing else to complain about, really. It's, it's not, <laughs> life's not been bad. Hmm? Um, uh, my re oh, big regret is song, not getting man. a signed copy of Dungeon Dragons by Dave Anson mm. and Gary Gagas. And he's got one. <laughs> It was your choice, though. You went for Empire oh, of the Petal Throne. <laughs> we used to divvy these things out. It was all very Thanks for fair. reminding me. <laughs> oh. Okay, gentleman at the back now. Um, after 30 years of dedicating yourself, what form of alcohol do you feel particularly adds to role-playing experience? <laughs> yeah, all kale. I think a uh, uh, Pichon Alon 81 goes very well with... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, with, with, with most, uh, <laughs> yeah, tastes better than blood of the zombies, that's for sure. <laughs> yep. Um, I used to use alcohol in gardens in the area to design a race of races, uh, and in no um, copyright in an idea unfortunately so what we can sorry uh, well it, it never happened it never happened no, no. We, we've got copyright yeah tunnels and trolls is, is around yeah yeah mm. but different system but it, it was something that uh, it's you know, well patented 
Yeah, I mean, patents can cause people. as much problems as they can solve. Then they can solve, and uh, you know, we've all heard about patent trolls in in the U.S. in particular, making a huge amount of money by just following up stuff like that. Anyway, let's not get into a legal argument. Any more um, stuff about? Yeah, the gentleman in front. Got something to show you. Well, you got the, you got uh, basically, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just um, did it like a flow chart. chart. Yeah. I mean, this Don't is just this. one section oh, of, yeah. a, of, a, of, a, of a book. So you start off at number one, you have 400 numbers predetermined, allocated, and the first choice is two choices. So you give them the choice of 311 or 6 to 9. And so you, it's just like, just like writing a, a computer flow chart. Oh, uh, yes. Well, yeah, you shuffle them at the beginning. Uh, we so had different ways of doing that, actually. You used to pick your numbers, had a list of 1 to 400, and you tick them off as they went, didn't yeah. you? To pick out, to make sure that they weren't. I, I used to do them in a different way, <laughs> of course. Um, uh, in, in every encounter, an area of encounter was a number, and there was A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the different things. And so they'd all come up with a, you know, 5F and uh, 23G, and then I'd go through listing them all out and cross them off on the 400. That was a bit more laborious way of doing it. Uh, but it was just a deep grind at the time. Um, we're way over the mind of run up to the oh. session, so maybe have a couple more. Yeah. Deep bit quantum fantasy has played an influence in deep game shows such as Nightmare or Raven. Uh, well, I think other people have to decide that. I th we, we hear all the time of people saying that quantum fantasy affected their lives and, and used to say in a very positive way on the influence on their creativity and ended up with you know, weird derivatives down the future and maybe that could fall back to private fantasy. The fact that we've added anything to interactive gaming is you know it's, it's a something that we're very proud of and we're delighted to hear of such things but uh, you know we can't really say yes absolutely. Last one? Yeah, over there. Yeah. Um, Fraser Frank uses the character in Ultimate Spider-Man Journey. Is there anything, anything they would want to ask the writers? Nah. Mm. <laughs> 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 Not that I can think of. Anything? Straight to hand, immediately, no. Mm. Couple more, if you've got time. Oh, oh, they're all coming out now. Yep. Yes. Yeah, yeah Carl Critchlow, Critchlow, Carl Critchlow yeah. yeah. That was brilliant. Bring him back. Well, we don't have much to do with White Dwarf anymore, but uh, they ought to be. He, he published a comic. It came out as... Fred yeah. No, but we'll, we'll talk about White Dwarf next year, maybe. So, any more nice before we're one. done? Okay. Did these stories highlight 400? Why not Turn well, to 400. Originally, what happened was when um, Warlock of Firetop Man and Magic Quest was finished uh, and all the renumbering was being done. It just so happened to come out to 399. Complete fluke, it came to 399 references. So he had to finish it with something round. 399 was no good, so 400. Somewhere in the book there is a false reference, which I think, from memory, it's a key number that, that throws you off the scent of the actual solution. So it doesn't actually mean anything, but if you're trying to cheat, it can throw you off. That's what the final one was. And that just became the standard. 400 was about the right length. The book was about the right thickness. Uh, we got enough uh, adventure in there, so it stuck. Did go a bit. Some of them were a few less, and some of them were a lot more. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's how it came about. OK. One more. Um, and well, I think we'd probably both agree that 
emotionally, Warlock of Firetop Magic is the first, as, as has to be our number one yeah, choice, but definitely. of my own, <coughs> my own writings, uh, Death Trap Dungeon, City of Thieves, and Brother of the Zombies are the three I like the best, and Steve? Well, I have to say sorcery, because I put a lot of my life into sorcery. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, and it's interesting to see whether it was a good move or not to do it for Geraldine or have it within the 59, you know, the, the main series of 59. Would have been a bit awkward in the main series of 59 because there were four different adventures. And Icon did that, slotted them in every other one. So, yeah, okay. who knows? Um, all I can say is uh, thank you very much for, for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we are going to do a signing if anyone wants their books that they brought with them signing, or you can buy them. There's an icon stand near the stage, and we're going to go there right now. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And Ian Livingstone, Steve Jackson's Indeed Legends in their own right even though it's quite funny that when, when you talk to them, they are so humble and they are so gnong up their own bumps about it. And yet they have had such an incredible footprint on the gaming industry worldwide. It's hard to uh, to estimate what effect the, the two of them have had. I mean, obviously, Ian's had an OBE <laughs> for services, <laughs> and, and and Steve Jackson and and he have both been instrumental in cre in the UK's creation of a video games industry. So, in a way, what they've done is they've actually uh, championed and pioneered two completely separate major effects on the on the kind of role playing and games playing within the UK, mm. uh, and obviously Games Workshop and the White Dwarf and the Games Days and the, the history is there and it's really nice to watch them talk and what's nice is that I've seen them a few times speak but every time they come up with something slightly different yes. the, there's a rich tapestry that they weave slightly differently each time so it's never just the same thing or them getting on the high horse and mm -hmm. kind of like look at who we are yes. and I think Ian Livingston is a consummate professional and politician which is I think one of the reasons why he's the darling of the government in that he's trying to champion the ICT curriculum mm -hmm. which is something that we talk about in the audio interview. Yes. Uh, do you know one thing that I find really very interesting and quite charming in its own right as well? Uh, and is that the fact that they don't need this. They don't need to be here. They are both professionals in their own right. They don't need to do any more fighting fantasy. They have proven to the world that they, they are who they are. And yet they still absolutely love it and they do this because I mean, they, let's face it Ian Livingstone is hardly short, short of cash you know <laughs> come on um, so it's it's not that they are making millions out of this they are doing this because they really really love it and I think that is absolutely brilliant to see that after so many years it's just so passionate yeah it's obvious when they talk about their games nights that it's a critical part of who they are mm -hmm. is is playing of games and they're really enthusiastic about that and I think that's kept them in touch with the kind of people who are here today mm -hmm. you know they, they love games and that's why they're involved in games and I'm just a little bit jealous really <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean it's really nice to see the discussions and them open, being open to questions mm -hmm. and looking to the future as well as the past. I think that's quite interesting. I mean they're both very shrewd guys, oh, hi. you know, but they're also very creative with it. And that often you'll see people who are shrewd and businesslike, um, who may have been by accident almost involved in the industry mm -hmm. and then become the, the shining light through their business practice and their acumen. Uh, but these two guys are actually they've maintained their creativity. I can't imagine many people at the upper echelons of the games industry willing to take two years to write a fighting fantasy game which is what Ian Livingston did for Blood of the Zombies you know yeah and, and I think you know I would be as as bold as to say that the, the best will probably come out of them when they retire from their professional lives and have more time in their hands to dedicate to do what they really like I can imagine both Ian and Steve writing like mental when they have nothing else to do once they decide to retire. Having said that, I doubt very much that Ian will ever fully retire. Well, he talks about jokes about doing a, a, a Warlock Firetop Mountain for the 40th mm -hmm. anniversary, which is obviously in 10 years' time. I'm thinking after today's discussion, what will they do for the 50th? Because <laughs> 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 I can imagine there's stuff enough to still be around doing stuff like that. Probably, and, and, and sincerely hope so, because they, they have that 
drive to actually not just create new stuff but being able to inspire new people and I like how they're coaching and they're bringing new writers they were very welcoming and very charming with uh, Jonathan Green who is a lovely lovely guy and fantastic writer in his own right but they're also looking at the uh, the next generation as well Ian exactly. particularly with the Livingston Hope and the Next Gen Skills Initiative for the government have been looking at trying to change the ICT curriculum and they really see you know and that's a kind of tech end you know going into math physics engineering and so on and they really see they're really trying to pay back uh, and, and look at that next generation. And I think that's what's amazing is Ian has so many fingers and so many pies and yet he manages to keep it all going. <laughs> Which is incredible. Yeah. Well, um, I really hope these guys will, will come back. I mean, we're hoping to see them at the UK Games Expo and see what else they they come up with but i i'm very much looking forward to to more of the ipad apps which are absolutely brilliant i think choosing ting man games to actually create those apps has been such a fantastic clever clever move yeah yeah i, I think uh tin man with oh, the game books idea in is just fantastic more to do yeah indeed well well that's love to them and um, may they continue for youngs forever and ever